So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Tuttle. I direct the Maine Women Writers Collection. Uh, I'll take this moment just so I don't forget to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones. On behalf of the collection uh, and our curator, Kathleen Miller, as well as our co-sponsor, IPEC, I welcome you to today's Donna M. Loring Lecture and acknowledge that we are holding this event in Wabanaki Territory where those of us who are settlers have a responsibility to listen and learn. Today's topic is an important part of achieving that. And of course, it was Donna Loring herself who sponsored LD 291, the main law that since 2001 has required that K through 12 education incorporate Wabanaki history and culture. We're very grateful to today's speakers who will address some challenges and opportunities in implementing the law in Maine, and to Donna Loring for her crucial work in the Maine State Legislature and since that time, including her contributions to our discussion this afternoon. Uh, and so I don't forget to say, again, for those of you whose attendance today provides credit toward the Interprofessional Honors Distinction or CUP AHEC Scholars Honors Distinction, I recommend uh, that you please complete both sides of the attendance slip, which is on your chair. Okay. So um, I'm going to begin by saying just a few words about Donna Loring so you know who she is. And then I'm going to say a few words to introduce our speakers. As many of you know, Donna Loring is a Penobscot Nation tribal elder and held the position of the nation's representative to the Maine State Legislature for 12 years, an experience that she documented in her 2008 book, In the Shadow of the Eagle, a tribal representative in Maine. She currently serves as senior advisor on tribal affairs to Governor Janet Mills and is also the host of Wabanaki Windows on WERU and president of Seven Eagles Media Productions, a nonprofit whose mission is to eliminate cultural bias and institutional discrimination against Wabanaki people. The Donna M. Loring Lecture acknowledges Donna's depositing of her papers with UNE's Maine Women Writers Collection and is an extension of her ongoing work to address issues of concern to Native people in Maine and beyond. The speakers we have today, we have three wonderful people who have agreed to talk with us today. Two of them are here, the third is on her way. So um, one of our speakers today will be Fiona Hopper, who has been a language arts and ESOL teacher in the Portland Public Schools for 13 years. She also co-founded and co-teaches Race in the United States, Perspectives for Portland Educators an introductory course for Portland teachers on issues of race, racism, privilege, bias, and equity. Currently, Fiona is the social studies teacher leader and Wabanaki studies coordinator on the district academic team. Bridget Neptune, our second speaker, is a citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe. She is the mother of two, um, Azelis and Mo. And in 2011, she earned a bachelor's degree in nursing and in 2016, a master's degree in nursing. And she's devoted most of her career to emergency medicine. Hopefully none of you will have the need to meet her in that capacity, right? Uh, and it is her personal experience in the education system, the experiences of her community and of their children that have motivated Neptune's work with Portland Public Schools. And our final speaker today, Mary Herman, will be arriving soon. She is, she's on her way. Uh, she stepped in very generously and at the last minute for Education Commissioner Pender Macon, who has just had surgery as a result of breaking her leg. And so she sends her regrets, is not able to be here, but has deputized Mary, who uh, works in her office on special projects. So when Mary arrives, we'll look forward to hearing from her. Is that Mary? <laughs> Perfect. Don't be. I was just singing your praises and saying how happy we are that you stepped in. So hi, this is Mary. So. Um, 
I'm going to cede the, po the podium now to Donna Loring and uh, allow her to say a few words about herself and her experience introducing this legislation, and then we'll turn it over to the speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Always a pleasure to talk about myself. Uh, <laughs> let me just start out by, uh, you know, I had a, a birthday lately. Uh, you get older, you know, you try, kind of try to forget birthdays. So it just kind of reminded me, you know, these, uh, and I can say this because I'm an elder. Uh, there was these two uh, older women talking. And uh, one says to the other one, you know, I, uh, my hearing's going, my sight's going, I can hardly walk, but thank God I can still drive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just had to tell you that. Um, so the... Um, uh, the, the bill that I introduced way back when, uh, Maine Indian uh, it, uh, Education Law, <clears throat> uh, it, you know, it, it took almost uh, two years to get this thing through the legislature. And uh, at the time, there were uh, people who were trying to get a bill through uh, to add multicultural um, subjects to the teaching schedule. And they had tried um, at least uh, every year for like the past five years. So when I came along and I introduced this Maine Indian Education Bill, I was told that uh, it, it's got no chance, you're just not going to be able to get this through because the multicultural stuff didn't go through and this certainly is not going to go through. But, you know, you, you just, you have to try. Because if you don't try, it's, you know, you're not going to get anything anyway. And so, after a year of lobbying for this, and, uh, and, and hearing uh, the main public editorial guy, uh, I think he's passed now, uh, Fred Nutter, comes on MPBN and he gives an editorial against the bill, saying that there's too many teachers, you know, I mean, the, the teachers have too many subjects to cover already, and this uh, Native American history bill uh, is just something else that they're going to have to take care of. So we shouldn't pass this bill. You shouldn't pass this bill. So I, 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 I enlisted uh, teachers and the teachers enlisted their students and proceeded to talk to each member of the education committee. And that committee never agreed on anything. We, we hardly got anything past that committee. But with persistence and, and talking to every single one, every single person in that committee, eventually, I got a unanimous. And you want a unanimous because if you don't get a unanimous, you get a, uh, a, split, a split decision out of committee. And that means there's going to be a big debate on the floor. So this bill got a unanimous out of committee. Uh, it went under the hammer, both houses. And then it went to the Appropriations Committee because you know, once you think, hey, it passed the House, it passed Senate, uh, good, we got it. And the governor said he'd sign it. So the thing with these bills is that once they get to appropriations, and if your bill, I don't care if it gets passed by House and Senate, if that bill goes on the table because it needs some money, it's dead. So. I had to fight in front of appropriations to get this bill through, and they wanted to pull the guts out of the bill, which was the, um, uh, the, the commission 
that actually the, the, the History Commission, which was put together to gather materials for the teachers and help them uh, be a res to be a resource for the teachers. They wanted to just pull that out of there. And uh, thank goodness that uh, Senator Mary Cathcart was the chair of appropriations because she uh, argued uh, that nothing, that this bill went through education unanimously and that it shouldn't be touched. So we did, we got it through. Um, Governor King uh, said to me, Mary, you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Governor King says to me, Donnie, because he, he invited me to a, a breakfast with a lot of the other legislators and he made sure I, he uh, sat next to me. And he said, you know, leans over to me, he says, you know, do you think I'm going to sign this? I said, I hope you're going to sign this. He said, yeah, I'm going to sign it. So we signed it and it became law. And there's much more of a story to it than what I'm telling you, but uh, you only have an hour, an hour here, so I'm just going to give up my time and let people that really have something to say talk. Thank you. Is that working? Um, hi everyone, I'm Fiona Hopper, um, and first I just wanted to say thank you <laughs> to Ms. Loring. Um, it's really an honor to get to participate in this lecture, and if you had asked me just a couple of years ago if I would be speaking at the Donna Loring lecture, I definitely would have had no idea uh, what you were talking about. Um, and it's really only because of Ms. Loring's advocacy and vision and her belief in education that LD 291, and, and clearly her, her political tenacity, <laughs> um, that LD 291 became a bill in the first place. And for those of you who may not know, it actually started a nationwide uh, trend and many, many states throughout the country followed suit and have passed bills um, mandating that Native studies be taught in their particular states. Um, so that's just a little important background information. That uh, So what is that saying? Um, so goes Maine, so goes the nation. That's true in this case and in many others. Um, so I've been a teacher for quite some time, and uh, as was mentioned, the, the sort of the reason I'm here today is because of the work I've done in the Portland Public Schools with uh, a class called Race in the United States. And um, I co-teach that with a teacher of color. We co-founded it and co-created it together. And we view it as a remedial course. So it seems quite edgy, I think, to many people. But in our minds, it's a, it's a remedial class in understanding um, systemic racism, American history, and the impact of systemic racism on education. Um, and it was through my work in that class that I came to understand the deep importance of LD 291. So I did my teacher, I'm not from Maine, but I did my teacher education here in 2004, I think, at USM. Um, it, it's likely, I think, that LD 291 was mentioned to me in my, uh, in my, work for my te towards my teacher certification, but I have actually no memory of that. Um, if it was mentioned, it didn't sort of carry a weight of critical importance. Um, I even did a project for my final curriculum class that involved um, a proposal to take students to visit tribal communities. So I had some awareness that there were Native people in Maine, even as someone who wasn't from here originally. And yet that bill, when I left my teacher education program, wasn't something that was like first and foremost in my mind. So it was not until years later when preparing to teach this course for Portland teachers um, that I came upon it again and then realized um, its critical importance in Maine and in the nation and, and I would argue in the world. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Portland Public Schools, we are um, in the midst of piloting some new equity work. And the equity work that we're, we're doing, which is really focused on anti-racist work, um, among other things, is really new in the state of Maine, though not so new in other um, big cities and other places. Many, many large cities have equity programs. They have... Um, 
people who are in administrative positions who handle equity, but Portland, as far as I know, is the only school district, largest school district in the state, and the only one with somebody um, who is actually, their job is about promoting equity and training teachers. Um, and it's in that context that LD291 has taken hold. And I bring that up um, not only to like toot the horn of Portland schools, which I'm supposed to do, uh, but also to frame it that it isn't an add-on. This is not an extra thing as, as Ms. Loring described that editor believing it to be sort of like another thing that teachers have to do. Um, if you think of what is like central and core in, in instruction, understanding the place where you live and the land that you're on is the most critical thing. Um, from, from understanding your home, all else follows. And so it's in that context that Portland is taking on LD291 and really trying to finally be a, a district in the state that meets its requirements. Um, so that's happening in collaboration with our equity work. Uh, but one of the, the central pillars of why it has become sort of a big deal in Portland all of a sudden is actually because of the collaborative work between uh, myself and Bridget Neptune, who you'll hear from in a minute. And it's that cross-cultural partnership between tribal communities and school districts that is really what is making um, the, the law finally be something that will be fulfilled in, in Portland. Um, I think for too long it's been ignored and seen as additive and not as central, and it really has taken the collaboration with tribal communities uh, and the advocacy of Bridget and, and many others in tribal communities to um, have there be a partnership between schools and tribal leaders. Um, I was also asked today to address some of the barriers that we have faced in the Portland Public Schools. So. Um, I feel like these are, are pretty heavy ones, but they're important to name right away. And, and I've got some years of experience under my belt. So um, some of the, the major barriers that we are facing, as I think are true throughout the whole state and the whole country, are um, settler colonialism and white supremacy. And I picture these two things as um, acting as a dam. Uh, in a river. They end up um, turning, as a dam does, free moving water into an aquatic dead zone. Fish can't get in and out and life can't thrive. And they keep indigenous voices, um, if this river is like a river of knowledge and understanding, then it keeps indigenous voices silenced and non-native people ignorant. And my assumption is that um, many of you who are here are um, from Maine, are not native, and probably know very, very little about the tribal communities in Maine currently or any of the history. That has been, um, when, when any community I have spoken in, it's been across the board that there's a, a tremendous amount of ignorance among non-native people in, the, in Maine and in our country in general about um, indigenous culture and history. Um, and so I see settler colonialism and white supremacy combined, that they create a society in which white people are socialized to see native people as relics of the past. And this happens in one of two ways. Either they're seen as unfortunate victims of an inevitable demise, or as romantic, fantastical figures with minor role in the myth of American creation. And this ignorance resulting from the combined powers of settler colonialism and white supremacy is the barrier to LD-291, and probably most everything else. Um, so I'd like to sh end my little remarks with a quote from um, George Erasmus, who's a respected uh, Aboriginal leader from Canada. And I think this quote gets at the heart of uh, LD-291 and its importance, critical importance to us today. Where common memory is lacking, he writes, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be created. And I believe that creating common memory and creating true community is the work of LD 291 and the work of all educators across the state. Hello, it's an honor to be here. Um, very grateful for this opportunity to um, speak to you all and uh, carry the work of our tribal 
leaders forward. Um, I grew up in Madoc Magook, which is one of the Passamaquoddy reservations, one of two. Um, not sure if everyone here knows the four tribes in Maine. Uh, there's Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet. And um, I spent most of my childhood on Madoc Magook. I went to schools off the reserve, and uh, LD-291 was passed uh, close to the end of my high school career. Um, so I unfortunately didn't see the implementation of that. Um, my husband and I uh, were both from Madoc Magog, and we have two children. And I began volunteering in Portland public schools and also other uh, schools in the greater Portland area with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, talking about salmon life cycle and habitat restoration. And we were hitting a lot of um, fourth grade students and I really had no opportunity to speak about our um, you know, reciprocity for land and water because there were so many students who had no idea that there were natives in Maine. So I was answering questions like, do you live in a teepee? Um, knocking down assumptions that I wouldn't have a cell phone. Um, so, and it wasn't because their teachers hadn't taught anything about native history, it's that it wasn't brought into the present. So there's this, you know, those who may know that there's, uh, you know, Wabanaki people in Maine, they may not realize that there's a presence today and that, um, you know, aware of the four communities and that native people live throughout Maine, not just on the reservations. So initially I thought, okay, maybe this is just this district. They're really not doing well educating the students. Um, but as I visited a couple different districts, I realized that this was a systemic problem and would require systemic change. And that's where um, Fiona and I sort of started collaborating. Uh, she reached out to me and shared her ideas and I wrote a letter and reached out to the tribal communities um, leadership and asked for their support. And um, it's really encouraging to see where we are today. Um, and my role in advancing LD-291 in Portland Public Schools has been um, through a lot of volunteering and relationship and community building, establishing these um, relationships and um, working on the social studies vertical team. Social studies vertical team. Um, I know what it's about. I don't always remember the name. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Greetings from Pender Macon, our commissioner who truly had hoped to be here in honor of Donna and to listen to Fiona and Bridget. Um, yes, she did break her leg in three parts and had surgery and is working hard to heal. So I have uh, the tough job of following speakers who are doing the work in the schools, following Donna, without whose work we wouldn't be here to talk about. Uh, the main Native history and culture work in the Department of Ed. And uh, as mentioned, I do work in the commissioner's office in the Department of Ed, and I work with whatever the commissioner needs and special projects. And this is one of my very top, like top three, top two. And so I'm going to do my best to fill in for our commissioner and then answer any questions. So this is a little bit dry, but Donna told you the history of how the law passed. And after it passed, there was a commission that really rolled up sleeves to talk about content. And many, if not all of you, are education students. So whether I say the word content or curriculum or strategies, uh, forgive me, it's a long time since I was a public school teacher. Uh, which I was a long time ago. So basically, historically, um, I started in the department in March, and literally the first day we started talking about my working with the commissioner and working with Donna Loring, who is a special executive assistant in the governor's office, as you heard. And so we pulled together a small group to talk about kickoff of summer and fall of really refreshing, significant Maine Department of Education and Maine State Government attention to Wabanaki studies. So then the larger group 
of chiefs, education directors, university native study professionals, and other interested people have met twice. Re we refreshed the history of the law and the study commission. We shared our different perceptions of if, how, and if, how, and how well Wabanaki studies are taught or not in main schools. We talked about what should be taught and what should not be taught, what type of assessment and resources would be helpful, what materials there are available now and what we want to have available. We talked about pre-service education. Fiona mentioned she's not quite sure she ever heard about Wabnaki studies when she was in pre-service, as many of you are. So we've talked about the importance of getting to that. We, we also talked about some more sensitive stuff, which is why Bridget's here to help us and the message um, from Fiona. What are the cultural competence skills that we as teachers and the Department of Ed need to display? We talked about the pros and cons of teaching standalone Native American st studies content or integrating it. Pretty sure we all agreed the importance of integrating it. It is not a standalone subject. As you heard from Fiona, we are on the land of the Native Americans. Um, so it's important for me to mention that the new Department of Education learning results standards offer multiple inroads, and I have it right here for those of you curious, starting in kindergarten, inroads and attention to Native studies starting in kindergarten. Now, um, at our next meeting, we're going to really get down to nuts and bolts, and for those of you that are pre-service, we're going to talk about curriculum assessment, resource development and management, communications, and the very important and sensitive topic of raising awareness what is cultural competence? We're going to include human-centered design for social innovation, which is based on design thinking because innovation is very important to the main department of ed. And although Native Studies starts with history a long time ago, we want to be innovative in how we integrate it. So we're going to develop action plans. Important for you all to know the group is open. We invite wide input and energy. Uh, the main department of education oversees and staffs the working group, but we're here to listen and and improve on what we're doing. I mentioned a minute ago that since the legislation passed and the commission uh, laid out initial study areas, we've expanded our content areas, we've added additional topics. Um, we want to assure greater accountability and making sure, as I said, that Native American and Wabanaki culture is mentioned starting in kindergarten. Important for those of you in pre-service to know, the main Department of Education does not mandate what and how curriculum is taught. That happens at the local level. It's equally important that everybody knows that this work is at the heart of our endeavor, that it's important that we role model so that locals embrace Wabanaki history and culture in, in the right spirit. Happily, as you learned, the Portland Public Schools have already identified Fiona uh, to oversee curriculum support. I'm aware of, because I live in Brunswick and Pender used to be the deputy superintendent, uh, Brunswick High teachers have spent a week more than once up uh, in, uh, on at least one of the reserves in Washington County, which, which gave them confidence, and I, I hope that Fiona would agree with that. So. We at DOE are deeply aware of the sensitivity of teaching Maine Native history. I'm not a Native. Uh, we're pleased to note that we're in the process of hiring a specific or identified diversity and inclusion specialist who will be coming on board soon at the Maine Department of Education and will make sure we're on the right track, not just by curriculum, but by all sensitive measures. The working group has rolled up its sleeves. Oh, I'm sorry. Many of members of the working group uh, who are the experts in Native American history and culture have already been working in school districts, so we're listening to the experts. Again, I'm going to mention, because you're all here, we do want to give heightened attention to teacher pre-service or undergraduate ed and encourage real attention to teacher prep. Um, and finally, my own personal uh, request, uh, or I have a dream, I guess, in more than one way, but we really, I'm really hoping that one of the results of our work is to identify more Native American resource people who are able and willing and have the time to go into schools and work with teachers at all levels. And I know and we know we need to identify the funds to support that. So I'm going to stop 
Um, I'm going to be around later for those of you interested in some more nuts and bolts of what are learning results, what are standards, what do we do when. I have that, but I think I've already taken more of my time and it's time for questioning the people that are really doing the work in the field. Hi. I Oh, I was going to say, I can't see Fiona. So um, I'm Lane Clark. I'm education professor. I'm also the parent of a Portland public school child who came home yesterday with his spelling list. And the first word was Wapanaki and then Penobscot. I actually, now I can spell all four. Well, I can at least tell him the words and he can spell them. He didn't get indigenous right. That one he needs to work on. But it made me think of, and I said, oh, great. And then I thought, well, it's the week we teach, you know, a Wabanaki history, indigenous people. And I'm just, Fiona, you talked a little bit about how you don't want this to be a standalone curriculum piece and how you really want it to be more of a central, you know, emanating of the, the culture and the core of what we believe. But that's hard, and I've seen a lot of the standalone. How do you work, how do you kind of work against that, or how do you help teachers see that as not like, oh, this is Indigenous Peoples Week, and then next week we won't talk about it anymore? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so this year, I am leading a social studies vertical team, which just is education jargon for there's pre -K, teachers from pre-K all the way to 12th grade. Also, indigenous parents and students from the Black Students Union at Deering High School, and they have started some decolonizing work of their own. So my answer to my, my both long and short <laughs> answer to that question is, it's about the framework that you take to be looking um, at indigenous studies. And the, the reason it becomes a standalone is because we exist in a highly colonized educational system in which we compartmentalize everything into a little box. Um, and that's not the right way to learn. Uh, it's not the way that kids like to learn. And it's not really um, an organic, and I would argue even not even a respectful way of teaching children. So uh, the work is huge. So it's more than figuring out curriculum resources. Because oftentimes I hear this question like, where's the curriculum? We need the curriculum. There are amazing curriculum resources out there for Wabanaki studies. People um, who are not native and are entering into the teaching profession and Maine, like the nation, is dominated by um, middle-aged, or in my case, soon to be middle-aged, white women. Uh, that's that's who the teachers are in our country and in our state. And um, you could give many people the best curriculum that there is, and they don't know what to do with it. And so we end up defaulting to things like, oh, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. Let's have a spelling list. You know, not that that's a fine start, but that's not the ideal. Um, or it's Thanksgiving, and we're going to spend a day, you know, talking about what that means for better or for worse, depending on the teacher in charge. So this is about really taking a different approach to education at large. Um, it's, I think, LD291 is this entry point for uh, bringing in a decolonization framework. And if you're, I've never heard that term before. It's a little scary, but it shouldn't be. Um, if you think of colonization as the, the Latin root for colonization, um, means to inhabit. So you could think of that in the literal sense, people going and inhabiting other places. Um, but it also, you can think of it as the narratives that inhabit our minds. So take the Thanksgiving example. Um, most everybody here has seen some Charlie Brown cartoon or some something that tells you a story uh, about a bunch of white Puritan settlers eating a, a big meal with native people and everybody getting along. Um, that would be one colonial narrative that we have, all of us, deep in our brains. Um, the decolonization framework means really asking questions, starting to not take those sort of stories that are familiar or comforting or nostalgic, um, not taking them at face value, but asking questions, questions, and questions so that we start to understand why do we believe those things? Why is that our story and who does it serve? So um, this year, the team, we just actually met yesterday, part of the, the vertical team, we met at the Maine Historical Society and went through the current exhibit, Holding Up the Sky. Here's my promo, Tilly. <laughs> 
Um, and, and we use that as an example of decolonization. And that team, um, all of the members of the team who are people of color shared about their perspectives of what decolonization means to them um, personally and to their children if they had any. And many of the, the people in the room were also students and spoke to what it would mean to them, decolonization in, the, in terms of their own educational experience. Um, and we're, we're on the road towards really busting out of sort of the way we usually do business. So um, I can go on and on, and I, but I won't, but I hope that at least begins to answer your question about it's huge, huge work. I wanted to um, reinforce that I think the culture shift is happening because of this work. I have friends who are Syrian refugees. They've been here for about three years, and their children are in the Portland school system. And I don't hear about anything from school, but if something comes up, if we're talking about Sebago Lake or we're talking about, and they'll say, well, that's a native word, you know. And I'll say, you know, well, so what does that mean? And they, and, they, and they remember a lot about the curriculum and they talk about it and it has a meaning for them. And if you think about how incredibly displaced they are, they really, they're holding on to that content in a way that I wouldn't have expected. And I really am grateful that you're, that you're, you're um, providing it because I think it will mean a lot more to them as they grow older to realize that they're in a place that recognizes roots and, uh, and honors it. Um, so I just had a question about, you said that you had fourth graders talking to you about how they didn't know, like how you lived and all of that. And so is this curriculum starting from like the beginning and going to how few or like how present like native people live now or is it more focused on the past? Like how is it sort of developed? I guess is my question. If you are focusing on that and teaching kids that, okay, people are living differently now or showing how you're practicing um, different, I guess, your different cultures or um, how it is now instead of just focusing on past. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. That's a great question. Um, and I think that's where um, attempts have, have failed is that we're starting in, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and it's usually in a historical context, which, um, you know, instills a sense of, you know, past or even, you know, prehistoric is, is, is used, which I didn't know what that meant until recently, really. Um, so my thoughts, and I think Fiona shares them, is that with young children, we start with contemporary, we start now just making students aware of people's living in Maine um, and that there's different communities and forms of government. I'm not an educator, so I really don't know content and curriculum very well, but I think that you know this being effective and really making change, we need to start with with today and and get rid of the textbooks that you know speak of natives in the past tense. Um, and during that meeting, we there was a student. Um, she was from Somalia. Yeah, um, a student from Somalia was saying that she learned about native native history, but had no idea there were native people living in Maine. And she's she's in high school, and um, it was really um, powerful. She seemed what I interpreted to be um, happy to learn that. So it goes to show that there are those um, shared memories that can be uh, really beneficial to to all people. They are somewhat implementing like future, so it's not just historical or is this standard is now saying, okay, this is the present and people are living in Maine and teaching how they live now, I guess is my question. So it is now like that. This may be a, a, a two or three person answer. No, I mean, the so LD291 from my understanding is that it, it this is main native history and also culture. So, you know, we think about culture, we think that, you know, we're looking at it present day, but I remember reading in history books that, you know, you'd look at a 
you know, a group of people and you have like arts, transportation, like everything kind of fit into like this little like heading and, and here's this information that really, I don't, I don't know what you do with that and really meaningful level. Um, so I think it's important for, as we develop this curriculum, because we don't really have a um, formal curriculum yet, it's all being developed, which is part of the social studies um, work group and collaboration. Um, but it's gonna it's going to highlight um, in my mind it's going to highlight the presence and I think also you know putting native or Wabanaki history culture into a box of social studies is is not ideal I think that that perpetuates um, white supremacy because we're not recognizing the ecological science contributions that native people have made. Um, so, you know, also the arts, music, I mean, there's present day and historical contributions that um, needs to be recognized throughout all topics and um, throughout the timeline. I, I think Bridget answered it well, but yes, uh, it will begin with contemporary focus. Um, what we have discussed again and again is that the biggest mythology out there is that Native people no longer exist. And so you have to start early, early, early in a child's education um, for them to like to counterbalance that mythology. Um, so that rather than focusing on these sort of fairy stories about Thanksgiving, which I as an elementary school teacher, I've taught at every grade, K-12, but a lot at um, grades three through five. So instead of focusing on those past events, that elementary school in particular would be the time to focus on the contemporary lives and reality and presence of Native people in Maine and, and everywhere else. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Einstein. I work for the um, Historical Society of Wells and Agonquit. And I am here because I saw Darren Ranko um, or heard him speak at the keynote. He was the keynote speaker for the museum it's, um, and archives um, uh, conference this past Friday. He, he as well as uh, Cinnamon from the Abbey Museum had a nice um, panel discussion at the kickoff to the uh, Main 200 um, back in March. So I've heard the word decolonization a lot. And um, from my point of view, what I'd like to do is figure out ways to make public programmings, perhaps they're even family programmings, programs that um, tie in, bring, bring different people in, including the school teachers or certainly the, the students of those teachers, the students in that community. Um, so that's why I'm here. And I'm excited to kind of, because I feel like we're educators. <laughs> you know, we're bringing people through, telling these stories through objects. And we have a brand new gallery called Native Stories. And we've had the help of the Ranko family in Wells help us out with some, some of that. But I need to go the next step. And I indeed consider myself an educator, just all around educator. So... I'm, I don't have a question other than that I'm eager to an, to hear more. Oh, um, I, I would I would advise that you um, read the book uh, Decolonizing Museums by Amy Lone Tree. It's a great read for um, anyone in a museum or in an education because my God, schools and museums have way too much in common. Um, and there's a there's a three part framework she outlines for decolonization, which is what have been our guiding principles in Portland. Um, collaboration, so collaborating with indigenous communities, um, privileging of indigenous voices. Uh, so that's the kind of back to your answer about like contemporary voices being an important part of the curriculum, and truth telling. So um, I also am the parent of a. Am I not doing it? Oh, sorry, I'm no, so terrible at these things. Um, I'm also the mother of a Portland Public Schools student who's now in grade four. Um, and last summer, we drove through Pleasant Point, um, and my daughter just said, you know, well, what is this place? Is this a city? So I kind of, you know, we tried to explain what it was. And she said, well, how did, how did these people come to live here? 
and you know um this isn't you know this isn't how it's supposed to be and i thought well you know i have really fallen down on the job if she's asking these questions so i'm i'm kind of curious um from your perspective what are some things that we as parents can do at home to support um the programs that you're describing taking place in school because i feel like school can provide a certain amount of progress toward these um, goals, but parents should also be um, supporting that progress and uh, trying to recognize those goals. I was maybe going to ask Donna, because I don't have in front of me, uh, for um, resources and books that would hopefully be at your public library, if not at the main state library. Oh, wait a minute. It's right here. Yes, the list. So um, I don't know if Donna wanted to mention particular books for young children for families to read together and have discussions. Fiona's got a list. And I, I, before we leave, I have a couple of comments, but, I, but I'm going to stay here. Fiona, you can read your list. Oh. <laughs> um, I, it was really hard to keep it short. <laughs> because there are so many wonderful resources out there. Um, I think if you have the means and the time to take your children to the Abbey Museum would be a wonderful place to start. Um, and there are movies, and there are books, and there are YouTube videos, and there is curriculum, and there is online language dictionaries, and there, I mean, the resources abound. So um, this is just a very, very beginning list. It's, um, it's really oriented towards teachers, also giving some teachers some, or pre-service teachers, some resources for verifying books. Like you might find a book and then you might want to know like, uh, is this like a portraying Native people in a respectful way or is it not? Um, there's a wonderful blog called American Indians in Children's Literature. It doesn't have every book out there, but most and great reviews of it. So I highly suggest that you um, question things and teach your kids to question things, you know. Go, if you're if you're unsure of whether a resource is um, providing accurate information, like let your kid participate in that exploration of verification with you. That's for teachers and for parents. First of all, Mary, you didn't mention um, anything about the state website. I, I, I cut myself be, off. I, I know. Five pages. But there's <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of resources on that that state website for books. Um, a couple of great books, uh, Leaf. Leanne Francis wrote a book. I forget the names of these things. You got them on your list? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Donald Soctoma, he, he's, uh, he did a book about a canoe. Yeah, making a canoe. Um, Alan Sockbasin, um, what was the name of his? Thanks to the Animals, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, really good children's books out there. And then there's, you know, the thing is that when you say Indian, you think of the, you think of feathers and headdresses and teepees and, you know, and the thing is, you know, even we do, even Native people look at themselves like that. And I think that uh, we, we get up and we go to work and we pay, we pay taxes, believe it or not. Uh, you know, we get in our cars, we drive, uh, you know, I mean, so what is it? What is it that's so mysterious about Native people? You know, we have our communities that we live together. You have your towns. Um, so it, it's just not a big mystery, I, I don't think. What, what about you, Mary? What do you think? Um, well, I'm, I'm learning along. That's why I turn to the experts who are doing it. Um, but I don't want to forget, and I'm so happy Fiona mentioned the Maine Historical Society. Please get there if you can. And also, please add, and students are pretty busy, Colby, this is the, the, the Donna's Law was Native American history and culture, and contemporary Native culture is on brilliant display at the Colby College Museum of Art. Some people here are nodding, yes, you may take your kids. There are places you can hands-on touch the ash. You can touch the sweet grass out of which baskets are made. You can touch the birch bark out of which canoes and other uh, items are made. You will treat yourself to go to the Kobe College Museum of Art. Um, it's not open Monday, but take your children there and spend as long or as short as they can manage. Um, 
and that's and I, I I know we're running out of time. So while I have the mic, I also wanted to mention that uh, the Maine Department of Education Professional Development Teacher Training Day on the new Wabnaki Studies uh, pieces is. Uh, October 23rd, all day in Hampton, and probably most of you in this room are full of things you have to do that day, which I understand. But for those of you that are free that day, I've asked Joe Schmidt, our social studies guy, uh, and there, there are slots. And if that's something that some of you in pre-service or as educators think you could be part of, uh, come see me and we'll see if we can get you up there. Okay. Uh, I just want to thank you and say I didn't realize the magnitude of the work that you're doing. I had this image as you were talking about that we have a, a house of education that we've built in this state and it's kind of like you have to jack up the house and put in a new foundation and that, that has to kind of play out throughout every piece of our educational system. So thank you for kind of giving that big overview. Really helpful. So there's one last um, question over there, and so we'll take the mic over, and then I'll just let everyone know that at that point, you know, please give answers if you're willing, and then if folks have to go, feel free. If you can stick around for a few minutes, I think a couple of the speakers might be able to, but people will will keep it more informal at that point. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'll stand up maybe. <laughs> Hey, um, so I'm a researcher um, based in the UK and actually the term decolonization is being thrown around everywhere right now, especially in the social sciences to kind of allude to a voice of color or representation of people of color or anything to do with um, deprioritizing white Eurocentric voices. And often I see this being done by white academics like myself and other white researchers and everything like that, um, thinking that they know what decolonization means. And I guess I wonder what's, what's the challenge here when um, you mentioned there's knowledge exchange between tribal communities and um, the education community. And I guess I just wonder if, if the education system is a colonial system and if we're taking that as the presumption, is that truly decolonization when it's a latitudinal relationship when really native people should be leading that. So I guess in, in the effort to decolonize, shouldn't native, native folks be the ones telling the education system how to decolonize? And I guess I'm curious, like what, what does that look like? What, what efforts are being done for that to happen? Um, thanks for asking that. Yes, so we have been, um, it's been a pretty grassroots endeavor. Um, Bridget and I met in like a coffee shop <laughs> right when we started all of this. Um, and the, the effort has been that we, dis district leadership in the Portland Public Schools has gone and met pretty regularly with tribal leaders and tribal, com and, um, tribal leaders of, of tribal communities. Um, and have that's where the conversation began was what what is it that tribal um, leaders think this should look like and how can we make that happen within a highly colonized system as you point out I mean you know we're we're working with um, I'd like I like to say it's like it's de it's decolonizing in that it's a process that will have to go on forever because we'll never actually get to the we're decolonized place. I, I don't know who will or when. Um, but that's how this all began and I think why it's so exciting uh, is that it actually, like the conversation has been um, Portland Public Schools going to tribal leaders and their uh, communities to ask what do they want, want it to look like. So I just wanted also to touch on that and say that Portland Public Schools has done a phenomenal job as far as Fiona and Malia McNally? Uh, no. Nally. And Javier Botana, they have sat down and truly listened and taken that feedback and revisited the conversation multiple times. I mean, our, my closest relationship is with Fiona and she's constantly circling back around. This is what I heard you say. Is this right? How does this look now? Um, so I think... A lot of times we can go to you know a conference or a meeting or something and sit down and and get input and ideas and then you know 
it's taken in that institution and sort of made into what the institution sees it as, where uh, Portland is doing something different from what I've seen in the past. Fernandez, I am a secondary education with a focus in history. So as a, <laughs> as a future teacher, hopefully in the Wells area, um, I was kind of wondering how would you address the parents, like uh, my wife's family is very conservative. So they're already in a sense feel attacked when they take away certain parts of history from classes. How would you address parents that come at you with those issues thinking that just because you're teaching Native American history and culture that it's gonna take, like I don't see it that way, but I, I'm sure that I would get questions about that. Like how as a teacher would the curriculum address a way to address the parents in those kind of issues? Because I know that it would come. Like I can see it in the future where I, I would have a parent come out to me like, I see that you're teaching Native American culture, but is this taken away from what they would consider just American culture? I don't, I don't think we're taking anything away. No, We're, I, don't, I don't either understand how would you address the parents? Like, well, is there going to be something in the curriculum in the future, like you mentioned, that would address parents to kind of alleviate the concerns of parents? Well, if, maybe you've had parents ask you that specifically. I haven't had a parent ask me yet. So. I think that's a fair concern. That's really concerned to know. Sure. OK. Um, Growing up, I was brought up in a conservative, believe this or not, conservative Baptist home. Very conservative. And the way that I, I see this is that when you talk about Native history, if you don't, and, and I said this in the legislature, if you don't talk about Native history, if you leave it out, then you're hurting the majority because you are not telling the whole history. You know, when you look at Maine, how, how Maine is interwoven with native names, native, you know, the rivers, the, the, the names of the rivers, the names of the towns, the names of the counties. I mean, you're cheating your, your, your children. You're, you're cheating the people in general who really need to, to learn from these things. So I think it's a good thing to, to talk about history and to talk about meanings of words and meanings of uh, places in Maine. I think it just adds to everything. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that uh, they might embrace knowing a little bit more about their, their uh, territory or their, just like the, the, the 200 years coming up of Maine's uh, bicentennial. I mean, people really want to know everything about Maine. They just don't want to know this little piece. So, you know, you, you kind of have to include uh, how the natives contributed to the state for that. Yeah. I would also just tell them it's the law. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> hey, that's, that's my, that's what I would say, but. <laughs> Sorry, we're, 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 we are encouraging and hoping that uh, communities will start in kindergarten and that it will be slowly building with awareness and knowledge and then as you know kids can come home and say I learned how to spell Wabanaki today and so we just it's the law and we're proud and we're grateful to Donna for her persistence we're grateful to UNE for inviting us here and I don't know other thoughts beside we're gonna do it um. I just wanted to say to Tony's point that I think the more we teachers do to help our students and also work with families to understand history, then we get understanding about egregious mascots and we get support for those changes. And I remember, I think it was in um, Sanford that it came from the students. The desire to change that mascot came from the students. And the pushback in some parts of our state would be less there if our students, to Tony's point, are, are learning in our classrooms and also in for including our families in those discussions so that they understand and are not surprised when their own children come home and challenge, but they help with the education piece. So, yeah. Thanks. I don't have a question, but I just have a point that I just hope isn't lost on all, all of our students. This is an IPAC event, and you have modeled 
amazing interprofessional collaboration. And I want to make sure that our future teachers know that the, the work that you do does not just exist in the walls of the classroom. You need to push out and you need to connect with others. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Hi. I have a nuts and bolts question about where the resources reside, because I know that, like, um, for, at Maine Historical Society, we have curriculum that we're putting on Maine Memory Network, but there's also stuff on the state website, there's stuff on the social studies website, there's stuff on um, Portland Public Schools. So how are we going to coordinate getting all of that in one place so that teachers have access to it? Well, Donna reminded me that I hadn't told you. Yes, there there is a DOE website, and we're building on it and adding to it, and it's open for resources um, so we're not, we're not all the way there, we're not perfect, but that is certainly a place, whether it, it's the place, um, but yes, the DOE does have a website under the social studies, and we're trying to make it more prominent. That's a great question. Sounds like we should figure that out. Well, I think it's a challenge <laughs> that is good to hear. Yeah. We have something, and you can check it out, but we don't have everything. Uh, we literally have nothing on the Portland Public Schools website at this point, and that's intentional because I, I don't want to put something up there that's just a mess. So I, we eventually need to have like a good, solid one or two places that people can look rather than little bits and pieces everywhere. Sadly, I'm a professor in the education department here. I just wanted to applaud you, all the people who are getting um, resources up on the state site, because the students in my social studies class, I, we just introduced ourselves to them last week. But they're excellent, and I think they're far-reaching, and they're multi-layered, so thank you, because we can go there, um, and we recommend them, the, the resources. They're, they're excellent, um, so thanks. On the, the earlier question about how do you handle the conservative parent? I, I think that we have a problem in the way that we do history education and that we make it about names, dates, places, little bits of information that you can kind of squirrel away. And the reality is that isn't what history is. History is about interactions. And the interactions get complicated because there's power dynamics and all these sorts of things. But if you emphasize that it's people who are engaging with other people, and people who are engaging with the environment that they find themselves in, and that that shapes the way in which uh, they experience the planet and engage with one another, um, then you start getting into things. So is it, if you talk about native history, you're losing uh, white history? Well, no, you're not telling the story. You have to look at how different groups that interact with one another, in fact, engage and what the implications of that are. And I understand that we tend to do K-12 education and you know here's names, dates, and so on because it's convenient and easy and you can uh, test on it you know, very easily. But once students then get to college, I'm the chair of the history department, once they get to college, they don't have any clue what history is and they typically don't like history because they've discovered that it's boring because they think it's just names, dates, bits of legislation, battles, and I have to then try to teach them otherwise. So, you know, you, I think you could do a lot in terms of uh, talking about the history of Maine simply by complicating the picture and, and talking about you know, what happens when people who are different engage with one another and how does that change each. Um, when we talk about decolonizing, there's an assumption that uh, the colonized doesn't have power. And in fact, they have, of course, they have less power in a sort of traditional dynamic, but that doesn't mean they're without agency. Um, I've done a little work on uh, British India. And the assumption in a lot of that literature is that the Indians had uh, no, uh, nothing that they could do in the face of British colonial power. And that's actually not true. They were very smart and often very subtle, and the story gets much more interesting when you start looking at that. And I suspect you could do the same here, and that it would be really compelling. I'm not sure if I'm going to word this correctly, but um, I'm student teaching currently, and I'm working on a team, a first grade team, and in one of our PLT meetings, they, a lot of teachers were discussing how to correctly or authentically 
teach about Indigenous people for Indigenous People's Day. And they were, you know, looking for resources and trying to like outsource because they wanted to do it, I say correctly, or just without being offensive. And they and I was hearing teachers saying like they weren't comfortable doing, or not that they weren't uncomfortable like teaching it, but they felt like they would do it wrong. And so what would you say to those teachers to gain confidence? And maybe it's just reviewing the resources and gaining more knowledge. Um, I would say that Native people already know that you're going to make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> That's been one of my big helpful learnings. And, you know, and, and to try, but I have found um, in my work with teachers, predominantly white teachers in the Portland Public Schools, that, um, and my, and my, as one of them and myself personally, the discomfort with discomfort becomes so overwhelming that it can really mean that you are are not even try like you're you're uh, become risk, so risk avoidant that um, you end up sort of dodging anything um, that the history professor was just talking about that is about addressing complexity and the and complex interactions between people. So. I think we all try to do our best to be respectful, but you're you're gonna mess up, and you're and you're going to get it wrong, and then you're gonna learn and and learn more, um, and so strike walking that tightrope between trying to be respectful but not trying. Who are you trying for? Are you trying because you care so much about respecting indigenous people, or are you trying because you don't want to get in trouble for getting it wrong? I don't mean you personally. I mean one. Um, and I feel like that's a, a really important part of the reflective teacher practice to be asking like, we, we tend to think that that discomfort is about protecting other people, but usually it's just about protecting ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean, to, I'm speaking as a, a white lady teacher and there are a lot of us out there. I just wanna say, I was reading earlier today an article on white supremacy culture and one of the things is about perfectionism and doing everything right and not doing it if you can't do it right. So like really, how do we start to question what it is to be right, you know? And like to make mistakes is part of learning, right? So. <laughs> well, and, um, Professor, um, you mentioned so much of history is relationships and it's relationships with people and relationships with the land and relationships with the changing um, industrial world. Um, and so I, th I, had, I had two thoughts, and I don't know if this would work, so I didn't run this by Fiona and Bridget yet, but as the first grade teachers are saying, what do we do? Well, guess what? Maine Bicentennial is coming up next year, and a really important part of the history of our land, our state, is the Wabnakis, da 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 And maybe we bounce off of, which needs to happen for all of us anyway, th that Maine history started with Wabanaki history, for example. While I have the mic, and you're so nice to keep staying here, I just this morning started listening to Malcolm Gladwell's newest book. It's called Strangers. The students in the room aren't gonna be able to read it until the summer. But those of you who have time to read or better listen, because he uses original sources, this book, Strangers, and I've only heard the first chapter, is about strangers and how we learn from our interactions with strangers, and I couldn't help but mention it. <laughs> Thank you. And I just wanted to make a remark about your question about the um, parents and sort of how to how to handle those things. And for all teachers in the room, I would encourage you to assume that there's Native students in your classroom. They may not have feathers and look native, um, but just to assume that there's there's native students in your classroom, your colleagues, there may be native students. So when you're thinking about how to address that, um, you know issues that arise, I don't I don't know how to suggest you handle that, but to remember that you know your relationship and interactions with the students who may be native in your in your room, and that there has been such erasure and loss of identity for native people here in Maine that you know if you can center center that and and approach approach your uh, discomfort with that in mind it can be really helpful and and recognizing that the you know all of this work is important 
teachers are important, but ultimately it's about the the students, our children, the future parents and teachers and community leaders, healthcare providers. That's that's who this ultimately is about. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for being here, and thank thank you to our panel. You all were wonderful. Um,